I have some interesting quotations. And so the first one I already kind of referred to, it's Dita de la Mott. I translated myself, so maybe it's not so brilliant, but it does the job maybe. Regarding Tetritz, Wagner omits harsh dissonances, minor second at major seventh. The movement is determined by the stacking of two or three minor and not more than one major third. And this is not a quotation about the Wiesendorf theater. So it's a, it's actually about another piece. And so, I mean, yeah, it, it rings true to the maybe general setting of Wagnerian harmonies. Yeah, I mean, I'm not an expert of Wagner by any means because it's really not the kind of music I tend to listen to, but um, it's true that by memory, I tend to not associate Wagner with something very sharp in terms of dissonance. It's more, I more have this feeling of gliding through very distant keys via very small steps, right? As you said, yeah. uh, sometimes you will have a, a very surprising turn of harmony. Uh, and of course there are most, most likely there are exceptions to what we're saying, but, um, but yeah, in general, it's more about kind of gliding through in a very smooth mo motion, very parsimonious, as you said. Yeah. True. And so this is a technical quotation, but it's very useful, at least for people who are not <laughs> experts in, in Wagnerian music and maybe just want to learn quite efficiently how the style might work. And, so a certain way. Another quotation now by Ernst Kurt. One could almost speak of a, so he, he speaks about actually, uh, yeah, the broader, broader music history in that moment. So one could almost speak of a new conception of key, maybe so tonality. It's not, I don't know how to translate that properly. Yeah, yeah, yeah it makes sense. So conception of tonality maybe for the third time in Occidental music history. The first conception was linear based on the scales of the church modes. So I guess Middle Ages, for example. With the development of polyphony, it resolved in the harmonic conception of key or tonality. The conception was now based on the contrast of major and minor. Now the conception of tonality as well as the musical perception in general tends to be again under the vertically organized chord. I don't think chord is the same as clang, but I'm just, every new Romanian will understand me <laughs> because yeah, yeah. clang yeah. is something, um, something they define. Um, okay, line, clang <laughs> or chord and tension are the three pillars of the changed conception of tonality. Yeah. And so I think this is very interesting. Uh, one, one thing is it's broad, quite generalized, right? So um, of course we have to be a bit careful, but it still rings true to us today. I think we, we, we tend to, to interpret med medieval music as, as a horizontal music and a, a big part of Renaissance music as well. Yeah. He kind of understates a little bit not voluntary maybe, but, but he kind of understates the importance of Renaissance music in my eyes, because then the harmonic conception comes and this is kind of major minor and that's, that's already Baroque. So yeah, um, yeah. Medieval, medieval music and, medieval, uh, um, and Ren Renaissance music is kind of the same here. And w which is just not true because you should take into account the change of, of the tuning systems from Pythagorean to mean tone tunings and, and the new possibilities of, of the sounds. But okay, that's not the point really he wants to make. And I think it's very interesting that he now says we, we are back again into a horizontal, more horizontal feeling, right? But ironically, or um, as a paradox with chords, which are vertical, right? So a horiz horizontal, a linear, sense and uh, feeling perception of music based on chords <laughs> which yeah. is very, very, just a very interesting fact 
Yes, called intention, right? Like intention, the, yeah. the fact that you will be able to add layers and layers of dissonance um, that will somehow resolve. Because I think if, if, if you say he's talking in general about tonality in late romantic era or maybe even almost post-romantic, you might have this uh, stacking of dissonance that goes quite far if you think of the music of uh, Schiabin or uh, yeah. uh, Nachmaninov. You, you will have quite dissonant stuff happening and uh, the, the, the idea of release is a lot less bound to functional cadences but more bound to coming back to a stable sound, right? To a stable chord somehow. Yeah. Yeah, true. And so, in a way, it feels also natural to us, right? I mean, film music is, is uh, owes much to romanticism and, and to Wagner and stuff. We, we know that. Um, and it is it is something that, that we won't notice, at least if we just want to enjoy the film and don't want to do music analysis, right? And yeah. so it is a very highly artificial way of making music, which kind of rings true or natural or visceral to us. Yeah. And th that's very interesting, I think. Now, the next one is here a bit shorter, this formal tendency. So he talks about the form now of Wagner and Bruckner is characterized by the comprehension of form as force opposed to form as outline. Instead of closed circles, this formal concept strives to massive wave-like increases. The main supporter of this art is the force of transitional moments. I think this is very important, at least for me, maybe it's, it's uh, for everybody who, who, do, who does romantic music um, as, a, as an expert, it's maybe a truism, right? But I think it's, it's so important for me to understand it's in the transitional moments where the, where the tension is and where also, I mean, you could say the emphasis is, right? Yeah. It's not like in classical music, at the cadence or in Baroque music, also at, um, at cadences and, and these formal points or so to speak in Renaissance music at, at the clauses, right? Yeah. Or the, the moment before the, the clauses resolve. Yeah, it really reminds me of uh, one problem that I had and that I also even read about, um, which was about how to understand and perform the third piano sonata by Chopin, which is a very complicated piece. It's the late, the late work of Chopin becomes a lot more polyphonic and complicated. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yes, I, at some point I realized that in this piece, the focus was really on whatever is in between the main themes, whatever is connecting uh, the big elements that normally make up the form. That's where the true virtuosity was. That's where the, the heart of the work was. And for me, this was a very strange feeling, even though back then I, I didn't know that much music theory and it was difficult for me to, to formulate these things. But, um, but yes, so definitely this, this rings a bell that you have, uh, yes, as you said, the, 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 the force and the intensity in transitional moments. It's actually a very good, very good way of describing it. Yeah, and I think, I mean, at least if it's, maybe, maybe it's not news to many people, but at least uh, everybody who, who has to teach students and, and stuff, right? It's a very nice quote. It's a very nice description of uh, what it's actually about. And I must say, uh, generally, I have the position that formal complexity and the play with forms is a classical thing and romantic romanticism is to some degree has lost this uh, work in, in very detailed form formal conceptions something like that yeah. uh, Ernst Code wouldn't wouldn't agree at all he would yes. actually say no we have to think form as as a fundamentally different concept at least as it's full, fully developed in his idea in late romanticism 
and it's again it's form as force and the, the form which is it, it doesn't tend to to mark the cadences but rather points of a clim climactic points in harmonically transitorial moments yeah and so i mean i'm not fully on board but maybe i will be if i would analyze more analyze yes but i mean there, there is this um you can say that this kind of thought culminates later because if you think for example of the position of development in a sonata sonata form right if you if you think early like uh, nefe <laughs> you will have extremely short developments yeah. and that's that's even still true uh, later i would even say in some mozart sonatas and and uh, mm -hmm. with beethoven it starts to become more and more and um, and the romantic sonata is is almost only about the development and there was uh, i don't remember somebody told me that uh, I don't know which piece it is, but Messiaen uh, wrote a sonata form, which uh, didn't have an exposition and a recapitulation. It was only development. <laughs> because it's the only, because, with the idea, it's the only important part anyway. Yeah. <laughs> so I think it makes sense, actually. I think it does make sense. And I don't think the Romantics uh, would not think about form or would kind of ignore it as something secondary. I think on the contrary, um, I think it was extremely important to them, but yes, they tackled the problem very differently because they also felt they had to, right? Because I, I think we tend to forget mm -hmm. how much the romantics felt that they were living in the shadow of the previous generation, right? Of, of yeah. uh, Beethoven especially, mm -hmm. but also Mozart, I think. Yeah. And also Bach, actually. And um, for example, uh, when you have pieces like the the piano sonata by Liszt, which is a monumental work, which is written in one movement, I think it's a, it's a virtuosic piece. It's a piece that's fun to listen to, even though it's very long. But it's also the culmination of a personal research about form. And I think he thought very thoroughly and seriously about how to tackle the problem of redefining the sonata after Beethoven and, and, and bringing a true modern sonata into the world and not something that seems like a, like a copy of what has been made before. Okay, I um, just, uh, just wanted to, to do also the last one. Yeah. Um, again, as Kurt, one can describe the contrast between late Romanticism and Classicism in the way that Classicism focused focuses on closed phrasings and tonal unity, whereas Romanticism focuses on the outward striving forces or energy, I'm not sure, and the innumerable possibilities to avoid tonal coherence. <laughs> this is, of course, again, not news, but I think it's just well worded. And just very important also to to look at uh, how, how he uses these words, right? Force or energy. And yeah. also very, very different thinking about music, of course. But I think it's also, you see that you can, in the end, you can apply all these quotations. I think with some fantasy to my, um, uh, to these 16 bars, right? Yeah. So yeah. You, you don't have a period here. You don't have, I mean, 16 bars, it's not much, but uh, Mozart wouldn't write 16 bars as like, like this continuous flow of, of um, harmonies who develop their, their emphasis not vertically by force of um, vertical relations, but by different factors which increase tension steadily. Right? Yeah. And in the end, I, I don't know if you agree, I think, Generally, all these quotations ring true to what we can hear in this uh, piece of music, in these first 16 bars of that. Yeah, I would say so, yes. In any case, there is a diffusing of, let's say, uh, tonal devices that normally put the music in order. Mm -hmm. They're kind of, they're kind of, 
cut away, right? And and instead you have uh, some sort of a harmonic fluid that is just loose and that just keeps growing and growing. Yeah. Yeah, that would be that would be my impression, and I think it fits the chords very well. And I, I really like the the idea um, of a wave, right? So it's so really. Yeah. I think that that's that's a nice formal description. Also, this is really a, a musical wave. Yeah, yeah, um, true. Which, which sort of increases here in in, in this part, and then uh, has an has a steadily um, or yes, yeah, uh, it collapses. Wave. Actually, yeah, yeah. Yeah, maybe not collapses, but but it it, it goes back at the end um, as a as as a wave, which which just. Um, you know, um, loses yeah. its, its force after it had its peak moment. So, yeah, I, I really like the, the metaphor of the wave, which is, of course, um, a very um, often used and very known, uh, well-known metaphor, but still. Great. So, first time, first time Wagner for me. <laughs> Um, I'm very interested. It, it is it is hard for me to to properly properly understand Wagner just because of my socialization, and it's so really there's there's such a gap between even also classical music and uh, this kind of um, yeah universal genius uh, approach to to the whole matter, right? To to write these grandiose operas and yes. how to deal with that as a music theorist who is, who is not, I'm, I mean, I'm not somebody who would gladly go into, um, into four hours or five hours of, I don't know, Siegfried or something like that. <laughs> but still we have to deal with it even, right? If, even if we, we, we might not be um, fans of that. Missionados, yes. Yeah, because he's, uh, you can say what you want. And he's, he's of the utmost importance for everything that came after, actually. Yes, it's true. 